so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Fire again and again and again into the scrubs. Ammo going. Gone. Drop it. Shotgun. Blast. 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 Reload. Standing now. So noisy. Chaos. Firing on both sides of street. Some hit. Some hit. Move on. Some drive through. Hit. Some slow down. Some slow down. Some stop near tennis courts. Then move on. Reload. Reload. That was just one paragraph of many written from prison by the Hoddle Street killer as he described his train of thought in the moments before, during and after. He unleashed more than 100 rounds of ammunition on a Sunday night in August 1987. At first, many thought their cars were being hit by stones. But as they kept coming again and again and again, it was quickly realised they were bullets being sprayed continuously directly at civilians as they travelled down an otherwise ordinary arterial road just outside of Melbourne's CBD. Lurking in the darkness of the nature strip was 19-year-old Julian Knight. It was just after 9.30pm when armed with two semi-automatic military rifles and a pump-action shotgun, the recently discharged army cadet murdered seven innocent civilians and injured 19 more. Police descended on the scene as the shooting spree was still underway. The scene he left was one of carnage, a 45-minute shootout in a 400-metre killing zone that only ended when Knight ran out of ammunition and surrendered. It's a crime that changed Australia forever, carried out by a young man with a sick goal, to be this country's worst mass murderer. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. The events of that Sunday night in 1987 left Melbourne and Australia in a state of shock, seven dead and dozens injured. Vesna Markovska was the first to die. The 24-year-old was shot multiple times when she got out of her car after her vehicle was fired at. She was a broadcaster and theatre performer and had spent the weekend celebrating her dad's birthday. 27-year-old Robert Mitchell was shot in the head as he tried to help her. He'd only moved over from England the previous year and was the state manager for a stationery company. 21-year-old Georgina Papayanu also went to Vesna's aid and she too was hit critically injured in her side. She was an art student and aspiring lawyer and died a slow death with unimaginable injuries, losing her fight for life 11 days later. 53-year-old Dusan Flajnik was on his way to work at a nearby brewery when he was murdered. He was fatally hit while driving his car. Johnny Muscat ran from a friend's house after hearing the shots. The 26-year-old was fired at six times. 23-year-old Tracy Skinner and her family were on their way home from a birthday party. She was shot and killed in the passenger seat with her 18-month-old son on her lap. Shane Stanton, 22, was en route to a night shift at Australia Post when he was killed on his motorbike. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He had a rostered day off that evening and wasn't due in until the following night. Seven people were murdered, but 19 others were injured some very seriously. Many still live with the physical and mental trauma from their experience, like Steve White, who raced out of a nearby leisure centre after hearing gunshots, only to be shot in the head and chest. Decades later, he still struggles with his injuries, lives with PTSD, and now lives in Alice Springs, because being in the city where it happened was just too much. The man responsible for all of this unimaginable death and destruction, Julian Knight, currently resides in the maximum security Port Phillip prison near Melbourne. The 55-year-old Hoddle Street killer will never be released. Clinical psychologist Tim Watson Munro has spent a lot of time with him over the years, delving into the mind of a killer and trying to work out what makes him tick. 
Tim joins me now. Tim, I want to start with Julian Knight's childhood. Where did he grow up? Who was in his family? And what was his early life like? Julian grew up in Clifton Hill in Melbourne. And at that time, it was an inner working class suburb of Melbourne. His father was a major in the Australian Army. He was one of three adopted children in the family. And from a very early age, Julian had demonstrated a keen interest in the military. So even as a child, he would play war games. He would reenact major battles, battles of Waterloo and other major combat over the eons. And when he went to high school, he wanted to go to a school that had a cadet corps. And the school that he was enrolled at didn't have that. So they managed to find one where he could go to a separate school in order to partake in cadet parade every week and so on. So I I think the point about this is that from a very young age, he was a kid who wanted to be in the military. He wanted to be an officer and a gentleman. And, you know, he was academically gifted. He was Mensa material, Julian. He had an IQ of, you know, well over 130 from memory. And so he did well at school. He matriculated to La Trobe University, but dropped out of there because the politics didn't align with his view of the world, which was fairly conservative right-wing approach to life. Dropped out of university and then applied to be admitted to the military college at Duntroon. And he was accepted. And his father, who was a major in the army, he was involved in linguistics, suggested that he should wait a year to mature. But Julian was so keen to join up, he didn't listen to that advice, and he went off to Duntroon, where within a very short period of time, the wheels began to wobble and then fall off quite dramatically. So how old was he when he ended up in Duntroon? Well, when I saw him, he was still a teenager and I saw him at the tail end of the year that he had spent at Duntroon following the Hoddle Street massacre. So you had a young kid who was emotionally ill-equipped to cope with the rigours of a place like Duntroon. Duntroon has a well-established, well-documented history of bastardisation And what happened to Julian was, I mentioned he came from a working-class suburb. He was described as a boon, B-O-O-N, and a boon was somebody from the wrong side of the tracks. A lot of the kids that were at Duntroon came from more privileged backgrounds. And so there was all these internecine class struggles going on. And you could argue, too, that his superior officers also were immature. If you're a second-year cadet, you would get rank, so you might become a sergeant or something like that. And first-year cadets had to defer to their authority, even though they were still very young. And so what you had was a recipe for disaster, potentially, in terms of privileged kids lording it over a less privileged kid and using rank to affect their authority. And this is how the bastardisation of night commenced and continued. And he gave me and others many examples of this, leading to him tending to be very isolated, depressed, anxious, not given weekend privileges to leave Duntroon and so on. He'd be grounded. And prior to Hoddle Street occurring, he was sort of confined to Barrett's as a disciplinary measure and he went AWOL. So he left Duntroon, he went into Canberra, And he went to a nightclub there, which was known as the Private Bin. It was a hangout for all these guys. And he ended up stabbing his mess sergeant. Now, his mess sergeant was only a year or two older than him, but he stabbed him. And this really told everyone who was listening, sadly not enough people listened, that the wheels were falling off. So he was then put in hospital. He had sustained his own injuries, but... He had no psychiatric intervention or care. You would think following an episode like that, you might at least have him seen by a psychiatrist, but what actually eventuated was that his father intervened, 
he was a major in the army, and Julian was then permitted to go back to Melbourne to live with his parents in Ramsden Street. I think it was Ramsey Street in Clifton Hill. And he just continued to deteriorate. A lot of his old friends had moved on with their lives. He'd broken up with his girlfriend. So on the evening of August 9, what were Knight's movements in the hours before the massacre? On the night in question, that day he'd had lunch with his grandmother and there was nothing terribly unusual about the lunch. Driving home, the gearbox or the clutch on his Holden Tirana broke down and so a kangaroo hopped all the way home. And I suggested at the time that the failure of the gearbox and the car episode was a metaphor for his life at that stage. And it was following that he went to a local hotel. He drank a fair amount of alcohol. And then he went home and grabbed the three guns that were used in the massacre. It's a fairly sorry tale of neglect. And it really speaks to the need for people who join the army to be adequately assessed before they are trained how to kill people. The irony of Knight's situation was that he excelled in marksmanship. That was the one thing that he did well Mm. at Duntroom. And, of course, he proved that, didn't he, when the massacre occurred. How was he in possession of such high-powered guns at this time? Well, you've got to put it in the context of the 80s and the late 80s where There was less fuss about people owning weapons Mm. and he came into possession of these guns through his family. They were gifts from his family and they were stored up in his room and the ammunition was stored separately but not hard to access as clearly his behaviour demonstrated. So he had, you know, high-powered weapons, shotgun and a lot of rounds of ammunition that he then used to deadly effect. I want to bring you into the context of this story because it's 1987 when Julian goes on this killing rampage. Where were you at at that point in your career and your life? I was still a very young guy. You know, I'd started my career at Parramatta Jail in 1978 and I was young. I was 25 when I was given that job, much to my surprise. It was the worst jail in Australia and I can tell you it was a very steep learning curve for me. And so I spent three years working in the prison system there, setting up various programs. And then I met up with a forensic psychiatrist in Melbourne. I'd given a talk at a conference about a program that I'd established with the prisoners and others, which involved young juvenile offenders spending a day in jail as a deterrent, a crime deterrent scheme, which proved to be very successful. So I gave a paper at this conference. I met this forensic psychiatrist, Dr. David Syme, and off the back of that, he suggested I should come and work with him in Melbourne. And look, you know, I was a Sydney kid. I lived in Balmain. And initially I said, look, I'm flattered, but I'm not all that interested. But he started referring me work and eventually I relocated to Melbourne in late 81, around about October 81, and I worked with him. And that was really an amazing experience for me. He was an eminent psychiatrist. I learned a lot from him in terms of assessing people and going to court and providing expert testimony. So by the time Hoddle Street came around, I'd been working as a psychologist for, I don't know, roughly nine years. In fact, I started working on the 14th of August, 78, and Hoddle Street occurred in August 87, so nine years. Nine years exact. Fairly intense experience at the jail. And then, you know, working with Syme, David Syme, I was exposed to pretty high-end cases. I'd already undertaken quite a number of assessments of murders and so on, but nothing had really equipped me for Hoddle Street. I mean, it was a world-shattering event. There were headlines around the planet when Hoddle Street occurred. Do you remember yourself when Hoddle Street happened, before you had become involved in it, when the actual crime was taking place. Do you remember it? I do. It was one of those moments, you know, they talk about the murder of John Lennon and the assassination of Kennedy. I remember the event vividly. It was a Sunday night and it was on the news and I thought, what's going on? At that time, I lived in 
inner eastern suburbs of Melbourne. So I was probably only about 15 minute drive from Hoddle Street itself. And Hoddle Street, as the listeners may or may not be aware, is a main arterial road in Melbourne. It joins the northern suburbs with the southern suburbs going across the Yarra. And it's a road that people frequently use, me included. And then I thought, boy, you know, remote as it was, there was a possibility I could have been driving down Hoddle Street at that time. It wasn't late on a Sunday. And that was the whole point about it. The whole thing was so random in terms of the victims. It could have been anyone and so violent in terms of its execution. For those unfamiliar with what happened, can you help paint the picture for us? What did Knight do that night? Well, he went to the pub. He'd had a fair bit to drink. When he was eventually arrested, they tested his blood alcohol reading and it was still above the legal limit. And that was after he'd managed to shoot down a police helicopter. So he was quite a marksman. He snuck out of his house and the street where he lived joins Hoddle Street. He crossed Hoddle Street and went up to what I describe as a sort of, using the Kennedy analogy, a grassy knoll. And he set up there and he started shooting. And he kept shooting. And then he decamped from there. He ran along the railway lines, which were close to his house. And there were further shootings. And eventually he surrendered to the police. And he said to me and others that he'd always kept one bullet for himself. It's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. But as it eventuated, he surrendered to the police and uh, was taken into custody. But during that time, he did an enormous amount of damage, obviously, to the victims, their families, those that survived. And I think, too, I mean, I've suggested this many times over the decades, to the broader citizenry of Melbourne. I think we all developed a vicarious sense of post-traumatic stress at that point because nothing like that had ever happened in Melbourne. At the time, it was probably the largest mass murder, apart from colonial times, that we'd experienced. So it affected us all, and I think it still does in some ways. I think the whole dynamic of Melbourne being a, a relatively peaceful, safe city, notwithstanding the gangland murders and the painters and dockers over the years, was irrevocably changed. As you alluded to before as well, it's the fact that these people that were killed, they were from all walks of life. You could kind of place yourselves in their shoes. They were coming back from birthday parties. They were on their way to work. There was a young mother with her child on her lap. It was all these mm. kinds of instances where people in Melbourne could have seen themselves as that person in that car. It's the random nature of these events. And, of course, it's not peculiar to Melbourne. Every time there's a massacre, inevitably there's innocent victims, you know, people going about their business, people in shopping centres, people going to work, you know, postal centres in the USA and so on. And it just keeps on happening. And that's, I think, part of the terror that, you know, you live a well-ordered life, you do as you're told, as you say, you're coming home from a birthday party, a nice Sunday afternoon somewhere, meeting with family and friends, and out of the blue, your life is terminated through no fault of your own. And I think that's really what stuck with people in Melbourne, that how could this be happening in our city at this time? When you say he was firing on the road, was he aiming at people or was he kind of just hoping he'd hit someone? Oh, no, he was a marksman and he was quite deliberate in terms of his targets. It wasn't just scattergun shooting. He was picking out targets. And there was one guy, I think he was a motorcyclist, probably the first person who was shot. And he wasn't sure if he was dead or not. So he shot him again. Bearing in mind that he was trained to shoot as a marksman. He had specialist training at Duntran. He did it with deadly effect. With the context of when this happened, it was quite a few years before Firearms were banned in Australia. That took another nine years with the Port Arthur massacre. Mm. Why do you think this one didn't force the government to act? Because it feels like, you know, we've just described it. It was a, a horrific mass murder in Australia, but it took another nearly decade for us to change the laws. 
Oh, look, I think the laws and politicians are very slow to react to these things. I think you need to consider it in the context of a very powerful gun lobby in Australia. There was certainly a lot of chatter about we've got to get these guns away from people. It has to be regulated more effectively. But it wasn't politically viable, I suspect, to really come down from a great height on this. And as you correctly point out, it was really only the Port Arthur massacre where, you know, a lot more people were killed with Martin Bryant that John Howard took, I think, the very courageous step of saying enough is enough. And we now live with the benefit of that. You know, there's still a big gun problem in Australia, but I think it would have been much worse had Howard not acted in that way at that time. Definitely. Let's get back to Knight. We've spoken about how he planned to... I guess, take himself out before the end of the massacre, but he is arrested alive. Did he talk straight away with police when he was arrested? Yes, he did. He was taken down to the St Kilda Road Police Complex, which was a major police centre in Melbourne at that time, and he was interviewed. I've seen excerpts from the interview. Actually, I saw them as part of the assessment process, but they're now freely available. So he spoke to the police. He was interviewed about what he had done. He was well aware of what he had done and the consequences of what he has done. He was articulate. And then I remember towards the end of the interview, they had a break and they asked him if he wanted to see the morning newspapers. This was, say, the next morning. And they brought in, you know, the relevant uh, Melbourne papers at that time and he poured over them with keen interest. Mm. He was the headline act, you know. So he knew what he was doing. He described what he had done. And then later that day on the Monday, the police took him down to Hoddle Street where they did a videotaped reenactment of the whole thing. So where he was on the grassy knoll, as I've described it, shoot along the railway tracks, and then him hiding in bushes around Creekland there before he surrendered. So all of that was captured on a replay video. And he was just an open book. He just told them exactly what he did as he did Absolutely. So at what point in this story do you kind of come in? When did you first meet Julian? I met him, I think it was within two to three weeks. I mean, you'll appreciate it's a long time ago. It's... uh, a very long time ago, 30, what, 36 years ago now. But I don't remember exactly when. I just know it was proximal to the event. And David signed the psychiatrist I mentioned had also been retained to examine him independently from me. And I can remember going out to the old Pentridge, going down to the prison hospital. I didn't know what to expect I didn't know whether I was going to have a very angry, psychopathic, hostile teenager to deal with or I really didn't know. But as it eventuated, he was very respectful. He stood up when I came into his room and uh, he walked me through everything he'd done. So rather than being hostile, he was incredibly cooperative in terms of my questioning of him. Was there anything that surprised you about Knight? I was very surprised when I met him. Because, you know, given the magnitude of what he'd done, which grabbed the headlines around the planet, and I had dealt with some very nasty, angry, destructive murderers prior to that, both working in Parramatta Jail, which was an end-of-the-line multi-recidivist prison, and through the assessments that I'd done subsequent to coming to Melbourne in 81, I anticipated that I'd be dealing with a very hostile, angry monster in inverted commas and his demeanor and his respect of me surprised me he was very cooperative and i was taken by his intelligence he was highly intelligent and he was articulate and he had a very sharp analytical mind so quite unusual in terms of prior cases i'd done involving acts of violence not this extreme but you know I'd seen it all until then. What had you been asked to do? What was the assessment you were doing on him for? Look, it was a work in progress type of assessment. The 
the lawyer, he was a legal aid lawyer, Mick O'Brien, wanted to get some initial feedback proximal to the event of Hoddle Street to see what Knight's mental state was and any sort of working hypotheses referable to a potential defence to this. You know, is he mad? Is he bad? What was going on in his mind? Was he intoxicated with drugs? Those sort of usual parameters which psychologists and psychiatrists explore. And, you know, I saw him. I can't remember how long I spent with him. It was a fair while. It was on a weekend and I rang Mick O'Brien before we had mobile phones, you know. <laughs> I rang him on the Monday and gave him some verbal feedback about what I thought, which was he's not crazy. He knew what he was doing. He was an articulate, cooperative, highly intelligent guy. And then when I say work in progress, I saw him on subsequent occasions over the course of about 12 months or so. David Symes saw him as well. And then another eminent psychologist, Dr Ken Byrne, was asked to examine him as well. So there were the three of us giving an opinion for the defence. He was also assessed by the late Dr Alan Bartholomew, who was the chief crown psychiatrist. And I think we were all as one that, you know, there was no mental state defence to this. Every avenue had been explored, obviously, with meticulous detail because if there was an opening they would have grabbed it but there was none and what ended up happening was a deal was done which involved Knight pleading to what he'd done in exchange for being given a minimum term on his life sentence. What he tells me, I'm not sure that it's absolutely correct but he said that he pleaded guilty that he was offered the deal because they didn't want evidence regarding the bastardisation at Duntroon to be let in open court. So what happened was he was given a life sentence with a minimum of 27 years to serve. And these days, 27 years to most people doesn't seem like much, but in the context of the 80s, that was a big whack. You know, the average murderer was probably doing 15 or 17 years, you know, and and getting out on licence. So he was given a life sentence with 27 years to serve. I spoke to him afterwards and I said, look, you know, it's a long time, but you're only 20, 21 years of age. If you pull your head in, don't make a nuisance of yourself. Show some reformation and contrition you might just have a chance at getting out at the end of that 27 years. Well, we're now into our 36th year, right? So he's gone a long way beyond the non-parole period. In the interim, he's been declared a vexatious litigant. Because of his intelligence, he takes the authority on all the time. And that basically means, I guess in colloquial terms, that he's a bit of a pest, isn't it, to the court system? What does that mean? Well, that's how they describe him, as a pest, but I think there's a lot more to that. You know, you don't get away with what he did in Melbourne and expect people to forget about it. And I can remember commenting at the time that people either knew one of the deceased or had a relative who knew one of the deceased or it was a relative of the deceased, and there was this huge multiplier effect. And so I think when he went to jail, there was a kind of unwritten agreement that he was not going to get easy street at any point. So despite his intelligence, he's always had menial jobs to do, sorting nuts and bolts and that sort of thing. He may have completed a degree, but never put to effect. And, you know, he's become a fairly competent jailhouse lawyer. And so eventually he was declared a vexatious litigant because of that. And eventually the government passed a special act It's colloquially known as the Julian Knight Act, which essentially argues that Knight can't be released until he's either terminally ill or too old and feeble to present a risk and a threat to the Melbourne community or the Australian public. And he recognises that. He recognises that he's never going to get out of jail. When you say he kept approaching the court, what was he trying to do? Get parole or get out? What was he trying to... Achieve. Oh, look, there's been many actions, many actions by night, referable to jail conditions, referable to 
a whole lot of things that he would argue is his right in prison. I saw him last probably five years ago where he was not reconciled, but he knew that he was not getting out. And he was saying, look, they've done nothing to assist me to prepare me to get out of prison. I mean, normally people might do a third of their sentence in maximum security, a third of their sentence in medium, then they get into low security situations where they get work release and weekend relief and release and those sorts of things. He's had none of that. He's done the whole time in maximum security jail. So a lot of his earlier litigation was really him insisting upon his rights as he saw them at that time. And, you know, it's been ongoing. As I understand it, there's current litigation between Knight and the government referable to what happened and being bullied and a duty of care that was owed to him by the Australian government at that time. Do you think there's any merit in that argument that the prison should have tried to reform him? Well, I think prisons are described as places where people should be rehabilitated. But rehabilitation, literally interpretation, that is return to one's former self. And so they're pretty effective at rehabilitating. If you look at recidivism rates, I think people go to jail to be punished. Punishment is the deprivation of liberty and subject to their capacity to receive and undertake treatment and undertake programs. I think we as a society should do our best to make sure that that occurs. Because if we don't do that, you're turning people back on the street who are likely to re-offend. And then we as a society suffer as a consequence. Having said that, it's a bit of a lucky dip for prisoners, you know, whether they get treatment. There are enormous logistic issues referable to treatment now in jails. There's a paucity of psychologists. COVID really, you know, blew treatment programs to smithereens for a while. A lot of the people that I see in Victoria and elsewhere around Australia, they all say the same thing, that they're not able to access psychologists. There's some very good drug treatment programs in jails now, good programs for sex offenders. But you see, Knight, I think, was A, in the too hard basket, and B, there was really no incentive or motivation for the prison authorities to assist him in any way. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with clinical psychologist Tim Watson Munro about the Hoddle Street Massacre. I want to rewind a little bit and ask you a few more Mm. questions from back, you know, 36 years ago when he was first arrested. Did he tell you back then why he did it? Not really, no. We had to hypothesise about all of that. My hypothesis was that he was obviously, it's not rocket science, he was very angry. Some suggested he might have had a dissociative reaction. What he told me that was when he started shooting, he went into combat mode. Combat mode meaning you, you just kill or be killed. He suggested at one point that he thought that he was under threat and Melvin was under threat but it wasn't a psychotic delusion that he had. And whatever that may have been at the time, it wasn't enough to represent any sort of mental state defence in terms of his criminal activity. I think one of the creepier things about Knight and what he did in the aftermath of the massacre was the poem he sent you and the musings he sent you Mm. to read. For the listeners, he shared they were rather unhinged train of thought Mm. musings about exactly what he was doing as he was doing it. I want to share a little bit of the poem which you've published in your book. To give listeners an idea, it starts, The whole world's a battlefield. The grim reaper and the angel of mercy walk side by side, carrying out their chosen tasks hand in hand. On that fateful night in August, the avenging angel executed its final order. It goes on. What did you make of that? I don't even know what he's trying to say there. Well, it's like a a word salad, isn't it? Mm. It's it's just a continuous expression of thoughts of what was going on. And I think he did that to try and give us some indication of what was going on in his head at that time. And 
It's very troubling material. I agree with you. It's very troubling, but not the material of a madman. People might say, well, this is crazy, but he wasn't legally insane. And that's often the defence that people who do something like this try and get, isn't it? They used to. The insanity defence was very popular when the result of a murder conviction was the noose. When we had capital punishment in Australia, psychiatrists and psychologists were very busy in terms of trying to establish insanity at the material time. What would happen then is that they would be found not guilty by virtue of insanity and they would be held at the governor's pleasure, as it was described, either in jail or in a mental health facility. What happened with the abolition of capital punishment, the incentive to avoid the nurse was removed and people were finding that by putting up an insanity defence, on average they were doing a lot more jail time than if they were found guilty of murder where they would get a life sentence and then eventually when they brought in legislation they had to be given a minimum term of incarceration as well. So historically, yes, very popular in the past. These days, I mean, I've done countless murder cases over the years. It's very rare that the issue of insanity would be suggested or let alone litigated in a a criminal court because unless they are glaringly crazy, you know, where they have psychotic delusions, they're hearing voices. I had a case some years ago that the guy who killed his mother, he believed she was a witch. He then burnt down the house with her inside it. And there was no argument between the defence and the prosecution. He was clearly mad. The great tragedy with this guy is he went off to the Thomas Embling Centre, which is a dedicated psychiatric facility in Victoria, the criminally insane, and he was due to get released on home release and he was murdered by another crazy prisoner in there or inpatient. So it's something that people tend to avoid these days. I mean, it's, it's if it has merit, it should be run, clearly, but mm. it's often very hard to determine insanity unless it's really frank and presents that way. Mm? Did Knight show any hint of remorse when he was describing all of this stuff to you back then? Not then, no. This was one of the ongoing criticisms of Julian, that there'd been no explanation what had occurred and no expressions of remorse. And in about 2018, I went to visit him. Channel 7, the Sunday night program, was doing a 30-year anniversary special on Hoddle Street, and I was interviewed as part of that with Knight's permission. In fact, he knew I was doing it and he wanted to be on the program as well. Julian likes to keep the memory of Julian alive in many ways. And the film crew wanted to go into the Port Phillip jail where he was lodged. And the government said, we're not giving you permission to do that, but you can wait outside. So I went in to see him and we had a big discussion about all of that. And I said, look, is there anything you want to say about this 30 years on? And It was at that point that he said, I'm sorry for what I've done. I suspect that he always was aware of the impact he had on the Melbourne community and the Australian community. But the fact that he'd actually articulated remorse, I thought, was significant. That was the first time. It sounds like he had more remorse for the community as a whole compared to the actual victims that he killed, the families he shattered, the the people who died. It's hard to determine. Look, you know, it's been a closed book for decades, but he never really talked about the victims with me and it wasn't part of my remit to do that really because it was more about what was his mental state, did he express remorse. You know, as an aside, I was privy to all that material and the photographs and so on, and I've written about this, you know, I became very immersed in this case and it probably affected me more than Knight, I think, at that time. In what way did it affect you? Was it talking to him or was it what he did? Oh, I think it was the magnitude of the crimes. And as we've discussed, the random nature of it, it gets you thinking about it. Look, you know, first responders and so on, I've written about it, they all develop symptoms of vicarious post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think that, I've said this publicly many times, it was something that affected me in a fairly major way, although 
I didn't recognise it at the time. You know, I was so full of hubris and ambition and I was so busy. It did, I didn't have time to unpack it, but it certainly did have an impact on me and others that I've spoken to over the years, you know, police officers and so on. Some of the survivors have come out publicly in the years since the massacre and kind of spoken about PTSD, like you mentioned, or like a grief that they've lived with or having to move away from Melbourne. Are they all common experiences of trauma, of, of going through something like this? Well, people react to severe trauma in very different ways and multiple ways. Some people develop strong avoidance reactions, so wanting to leave Melbourne would be part of that. The grief reaction is often accompanied with what's described as survivor guilt, where I survived and somebody five feet away didn't survive and, you know, they feel guilty about that. There's the visual memory of what occurred. There's the auditory recollections of what occurred, gunfire going off, olfactory memories of cordite, you know, smoke from guns and so on. I mean, Hoddle Street was like a war zone. And so it doesn't surprise me that people have had this kind of complex reaction to it in varying iterations, you know. And it can't help to have the person responsible continuously popping up in the headlines or in the news or... Well, it's a trigger point. Excuse the pun, but it is a trigger point, you know. When they see the person that was responsible for all this popping up in the newspapers, on television and so on, it inevitably triggers a response. So, yeah, that's not helpful. How would you describe your relationship with Knight now, if there is one? It's professional. I've not spoken to him for a number of years now. He keeps in contact with me from time to time. This case is a long time ago now. And, you know, the last time I saw him in prison, it was a positive interaction, as best I could tell. And he seemed to be reconciled, if that's the right term, to the fact that because of the Julian Knight Act, he wasn't going to see light of day for a long time. I think he fully expects to die in prison. Lastly, I know... Treating Knight had a huge impact on your life and your career. Is it still something that you think about or that has had a lasting impact now? Not so much now. I mean, it certainly did 20 years ago. But now that I'm much older and wiser and I have very tight boundaries about what I do, I'm more philosophical about that case and, you know, the thousands of cases I've done. They don't affect me in that way anymore. But, you know, I I think having had the opportunity to assess him at that time, weird as it sounds, in many ways it was a great privilege for me in terms of being exposed to a major criminal case in Australia. It, It certainly launched my career in that domain. But perhaps looking back, you know, I lack the maturity and clinical wisdom that I have now to deal with a case of that magnitude. And I, I think there's a lesson there for all psychologists, mental health workers. If you're going to work in the deep end, be aware that there's sharks. And it's something that I've banged on about for a long time through the prism of my own experience, really, that it's very important to get professional supervision to debrief on these cases and so on. I don't do them anymore. You know, I'm very happy seeing Bill from Balgala, who's blowing 0.08 on his way home from work, (laughs) and I sleep at night. I don't think about it as much as I used to. Thanks to Tim for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to hear more true crime stories from Tim, we'll link our previous episodes with him in the show notes. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, let us know by leaving a review on whatever podcast app you're listening to us on right now. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.